Thank you. Um, and you guys can all hear me okay? Okay, if, if anything happens with the sound, somebody just let me know or wave like crazy. Um, and um, uh, Ariel, so I, I see that there are some people in the waiting room. I don't know if I'm supposed to, I'll just um, ignore that for now, I guess. And that, oh, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, okay, excellent. Let's get started. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Rachel. Um, this is Henry. He'll be on the floor living his best life and napping. Um, uh, he likes to, to sleep there and I like to keep him there when I teach on Zoom in case my students need something else to look at other than me. They can, you know. Um, but I'm delighted to be part of this conversation. This is also 282 people. That's, <laughs> that's impressive, especially between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is a busy time and it's also a time of a lot of Jewish focus. So I'm really delighted to be part of this really focused moment and looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'll start out um, of the hour we have together. I'll speak for a little less than the first half of it, I think, and then the, the rest will be time for conversation. So please, um, as I go along in my part of it, think of what questions you might, might want to discuss. Um, I will start off by talking about what brought me to write this book, um, how I came to fall in love with this particular history. I'll talk a little bit about the book. Um, again, I will try to, I always try to avoid spoilers, which just means I try to confine myself to talking about things that happen in the first quarter of the book or so. Um, but we'll see where the, where the conversation goes. So um, there's a quote by Henry James that I really like because it sums up for me something about why I write or the function writing serves in my life. And Henry James uh, said in, in, in the voice of a character he was writing about that the line is, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And the reason I like that is that very often I will be um, doing something out in the world and something kind of bugs me or doesn't sit right with me or um, seems to me strangely comical, but I'm not sure why. And if you ask me right in that moment what I think about it, I might not be able to answer. But then I sort of go off and I start writing about it, either directly taking notes in, a, in nonfiction or making up stories, you know, fiction, um, weaving something around, around it. And eventually I have something written and I kind of can point to it and say, yeah, that, that's what I think. So writing for me is a way of metabolizing the world. I think if I had any visual art talent, I would be metabolizing the world through painting it or making music about it if I had that kind of talent. Or if I had an engineering mind, I'd be inventing a better widget in response to the world, but I don't. So this is what I do. And years ago, there were two things really bugging me. Um, and um, I'll just mention one right now, although maybe we can get to the other one later if there's time, because it, it is um, actually has to do with uh, Jewish history. But um, the first one was this. Uh, it's um, the line from Virginia Woolf in A Room of One's Own. Uh, Woolf was talking about women and writing, and she was... Um, she was discussing the hypothetical question of what if William Shakespeare had an equally talented sister? What would have been the fate of that woman, a woman with that kind of intelligence in that time period? And uh, Wolf asks the question and then her answer is uh, very succinct and quite depressing actually. Um, what would have been the fate of that woman? Wolf says, she died young. Alas, she never wrote a word. Um, now, you can't argue that a woman in the age of Shakespeare, um, that that would most likely have been her fate, given everything we know about the restrictions on women's education, about even if a woman could get the education, um, uh, the restrictions on her ability to be in conversation with other people working in the same field, to test your ideas against, uh, against other people, let alone to get your plays put on a stage. Um, and then, you know, given everything we know about women's lives, um, childbirth, domestic labor, uh, you know, the odds are vastly that uh, a woman of that time would have died without writing a word or painting a painting or writing the symphony or doing the mathematics or whatever it was she had in her uh, to express. But I couldn't help shadow boxing. I couldn't help thinking, yeah, but what if, what if, what would it take for a woman not to die in that time period or roughly that time period without writing a word or painting a painting or whatever it was? And what if all the more so she was Jewish? This is the time of the Inquisition. What if she was poor? And I, I thought, well, you know, she would have had to be a genius at breaking the rules. 
and that kind of interested me. I thought, all right, that's fun. Uh, I want to write maybe something about that. And um, then I started thinking more about it. And I thought I wanted to reach back into history to look at the question, to ask the question of um, what does it take for a woman not to be defeated when everything around her is telling her to sit down and mind her manners? So the first thing I needed to tell that kind of story is characters who don't mind their manners. And that's, you know, great. That's fun. I thought, all right, I can do that. But I needed the right time period. And I decided I was going to start looking around for, for a time period um, in which to tell that kind of a story. And I thought, well, I'll know it when I see it. I'll, I'll, it'll feel right when I find it. Um, but also, I needed a kind of um, frontier, a moment where there's kind of a frontier mentality. And what I mean by that is there are these moments when the usual restrictions are lifted. It's usually a moment where um, there's some sort of either literal or metaphorical frontier where um, there just aren't enough people with the right skills. I think of it, or like the Rosie the Riveter moment, all the men are off to war. So, okay, these jobs will be filled by women. You know, there are no men here with the necessary skills. So, okay, you can do this for a while, honey, until the men come back. And, and so I, I needed a moment like that. So I started doing some um, research and I had this amazing opportunity. I was a um, Corette fellow at Stanford University, a Jewish, Jewish writing fellowship. And um, uh, Professor Steve Zipperstein uh, was there sort of hosting the fellowship. And he said to me, it's the most wonderful question to be asked, you know, what would support you in, in writing your new project? And I said, well, a, a little office to work in, a little carol in the library and a letter of introduction to um, the history professor so I can sit in on classes. Uh, both of which he provided. And I was like a, a kid in a candy shop, a, a really nerdy kid in a candy shop. Um, and I sat in on all these history classes. And I got really interested in the Jewish history of 17th century Amsterdam. Uh, people have said to me, well, you must have done undergrad or graduate work in Jewish history. And that's how you found this time period. And that's how you knew what you were doing. That would have made a lot of sense. Then I would have actually known what I was doing. But in fact, it was completely the opposite. I stumbled into it. I knew nothing. And then I had to really learn a lot in a hurry. But as I started reading about this uh, community, um, so my, my um, I was very ignorant. There were among the things I did not know. I didn't know that the Jews of 17th century Amsterdam were mostly Sephardic. They were refugees from the Spanish and then the Portuguese uh, Inquisition, and they ended up in Amsterdam. Now, that Inquisition served as one of those detonations, and refugees went in all directions. Some of them went to a Portuguese-controlled Brazil, and then made their way up and founded the Jewish communities in the Caribbean, and up and into the Jewish community of, of for example, New York, New Amsterdam, right? Um, other uh, Others of that community made it to Amsterdam. Um, among the things I didn't know about Amsterdam was that it was the only place where one could really safely and openly be Jewish in Europe at the time. So much so that they referred to it as the New Jerusalem. And there were so many Portuguese Jewish refugees in Amsterdam at the time that to say someone was Portuguese was a euphemism for saying that they were Jewish, kind of like people today say, you know, she's from New York, right? Um, I'm from New York. <laughs> um, so, um, and these Portuguese Jewish refugees were gathering in Amsterdam and the freedoms there were really astonishing compared to the rest of Europe. Um, there was amazing tolerance and there were just a few restrictions. Um, Jews were not allowed to debate religion with non-Jews. Uh, Jews were not allowed to um, sound atheist, but really nobody was allowed to sound atheist at the time. This was a time in Europe when people were li ripped limb from limb for being atheist. So this was kind of a cakewalk compared to what was going on in the rest of, in the rest of Europe. Um, uh, and another thing I didn't know was that this Jewish community in Amsterdam was the community that excommunicated Spinoza. I didn't even know Spinoza was Jewish. I'd never taken a philosophy class. So, you know, I was very, very unqualified to write this book. But what happened was I was reading a really wonderful book called Betraying Spinoza by Rebecca Newberger Goldstein. And I read in that book about Spinoza's excommunication. And um, I learned, first of all, that excommunication up until that moment, even though it's a big, scary word, was not a very severe punishment. In that community, up until that time, if you were excommunicated, it was, you're excommunicated for two weeks, say you're sorry, and don't do it again. That's what excommunication basically meant in that synagogue in that time. It was a measure of social um, discipline, right? But it was not the, the big scary thing up until Spinoza. 
When they excommunicated Spinoza, uh, it was a lifetime ban and the language was absolute fire and brimstone. It was God's fury will smoke against him. It was that kind of stuff. You can read the ban, go online, it's in, you can Google it, you'll find it in translation. Um, God's fury will smoke against him. Uh, lifetime ban on Spinoza, lifetime ban on anyone who had any contact with Spinoza. And when I read this, sometimes you read a really old document and the humanity is right there. Suddenly it all comes to life. And I read it, it suddenly it all made sense to me. I thought, you know, I know these people, these, these people, they're terrified, right? Because what they'd basically done was, yeah, you see, you see Spinoza, he's over there, we're over here. We got nothing to do with this guy. Why? Well, there are many reasons, but among the reasons they excommunicated Spinoza so hard was um, that he was definitely debating religion with non-Jews. And he was also sounding, frankly, atheist. And then you think about this community, and this isn't, you know, my own insight. This is, you know, from reading Rebecca Newberger Goldstein and Stephen Nadler and other Spinoza experts. Among the things that was at issue here was that you have this perch of safety where um, people have this tenuous, fragile safety in Amsterdam. And here comes this guy and he's breaking all the rules. And, you know, my sense of it is that it was sort of, you know, we got nothing to do with this guy. And w when I read it, what registered for me was, I know these people because it's centuries uh, apart in different communities, but they're refugees. And I grew up among refugees. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. My mother was born on the run. And there was something that was so familiar about a community that had survived calamity and is doing the fierce, beautiful work of rebuilding. But there's a sense that if one thing goes wrong, it could all fall apart. And, you know, and here's this community in Amsterdam and the Inquisition, it's not even in the past, it's still going on. Right. So I thought these are the people I need to write about. And then as I read more about them, I learned that there was this moment when one of the rabbis from this community, Manasseh ben Israel, <clears throat> reached out to Cromwell in England. Uh, this is the interregnum, English Civil War, and um, basically said, um, look, it's almost 1666 is on the horizon. And uh, many Jews believe that the Messiah was going to come in 1666. Many Christians believed that the Messiah was going to come back in 1666. And uh, the prophecy said that for the Messiah to come, the, uh, Jew, there had to be Jews in every country in the world. What country didn't officially have any Jews? It was England, because they had kicked the Jews out during the Crusades. Now, there actually were Jews in England. There was a small community, 150, 120 Jews in London masquerading as Catholics. Every, you know, every century or so, they would be uh, discovered, kicked out, and then eventually some would come back in. So there's this tiny Jewish community in hiding in London. And Manasseh ben Israel basically petitions Cromwell and says, can we get the Jews readmitted to England? Cromwell tries to get it through Parliament, can't fully do it. It was sort of a semi-readmission, um, and, um, uh, and Manasseh ben Israel saw this as a victory. The English Jewish community was not happy. They did not want to be outed. They did not feel safe. Um, and um, that's where things stood at this moment. And I thought, okay, here we have a frontier situation because the Jewish community that had been in hiding in England did not have a lot of Jewish education. It was a mercantile community and uh, they didn't have, you know, synagogues and, and um, centers of learning that were really sort of um, able to be out in the open. Meanwhile, this Jewish community in Amsterdam had been busy rebuilding and creating synagogues and, you know, edifices and institutions of learning. So I thought this is a moment when uh, there would be communities in Amsterdam who try to outreach and up the Jewish education of their brethren in London. And this could be a, the scenario that I would write about. So I imagined a, um, a rabbi, all the, if, for those who have read the book, all the rabbis um, mentioned in the book except for the main character, the main rabbi, um, Akon Mendez. All the other ones are real uh, people. Abab, um, Sasportas, uh, you know, all of the rabbis, they're, they're all real people. But I did make up this one rabbi and um, he's blind. And the reason I thought he, this rabbi would be a blind rabbi is because there has to be a reason he needs a scribe to write for him. So that was sort of as, as far as I got, I thought he could be part of going to London, bringing the people in his household, trying to bring Jewish education to a community that doesn't really want him. Um, so I started writing now, now just to go back to, you know, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? 
I improvise. I don't plan writing in advance. And I'd be really happy to, to talk about why, um, why I don't outline um, if someone wants to, to know in the Q&A. But um, I just improvised. So I started and I started writing. Um, I started writing with a voice. I knew that this was going to be a woman. I knew that she would have grown up among those Portuguese Jewish refugees in Amsterdam and traveled to London. And I thought, well, she's got something to confess. I wasn't quite sure what, but I, I started writing with really very little idea who the speaker was. And um, normally the first thing I write ends up at the cutting room floor, but for whatever reason, this stayed. It's the opening of the book and I'm gonna just um, read it. It's just one page. June 8th, 1691, 11th Sivan of the Hebrew year 5451, Richmond, Surrey. Let me begin afresh, perhaps this time to tell the truth. For in the biting hush of ink on paper, where truth ought raise its head and speak without fear, I have long lied. I have not to defend my actions, yet though my heart feels no remorse, my deeds would confess themselves to paper now as the least of tributes to him whom I once betrayed. In this silenced house, quill and ink do not resist the press of my hand, and paper does not flinch. Let these pages compass at last the truth, though none read them. So that voice, those who have read the book know, is, is Esther Velasquez, and she's the main character of the, the 17th century portions of the novel. And uh, she's an orphan. Um, she's raised in the same Jewish community that, that uh, excommunicated Spinoza. And she moves along in, in the household of this blind rabbi. And since he has no other educated person to scribe for him, she ends up scribing and in the process gets access to books and learning she would otherwise be barred from. Uh, but the more she reads and the more she studies, the more she feels there are questions she's desperate to ask and questions that in that age were forbidden. Uh, but she can't keep herself from asking no matter the danger it could bring down on her household if it was known what she was writing and to whom she's addressing her letters. So, um, but as you know, if you've, if you've read the book, the book actually begins 350 years later in London um, and Esther's voice has long since been lost. And, and so we're in contemporary London with um, Helen Watt. Helen, for those who have not read the book, Helen is a professor of history and she is a non-Jewish woman with a complicated and very personal reason for her passion for Jewish history. She's near mandatory retirement and she's in ill health. And among other things, she has a hand tremor, which means that she should not be handling delicate documents. Um, writing is funny. I, you know, of course, I was halfway through the book when I realized really why I'd given her a hand tremor. Um, I just, as I was writing, I thought, well, Helen has a hand tremor. Um, but I think it's because I always loved the the, the line, um, Yerushalayim, tishkach yemini. if I forget the O Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning. Um, I think there is something so powerful about the idea to me of a historian, someone whose job it is not to forget, right? <laughs> Historians, their job is to help us remember. Um, it's her job not to forget, yet she's forgotten something essential about her own life. And um, she has this tremor and she's barred from touching the things she most wants, the papers, which are the, the literal manifestation of the history that she, she wants to touch. Um, the novel starts when Helen's received a phone call from a former student she doesn't remember, uh, Ian Easton, uh, who says he took a, her history class years ago. And Ian and his wife have a 17th century house that they're renovating to turn into an art gallery. Uh, they have, uh, it's been in the family, the house um, they bring in an electrician and he is opening up an old carved wooden staircase to put in wiring when he uncovers uh, inside the staircase shelves crammed with papers. They're old, they're fragile, um, and uh, the writing is in Portuguese and in Hebrew. The, uh, they don't, Ian doesn't recognize these languages, but he does see that one of the signatures says Rabbi such and such. So he basically calls his former professor. He's basically saying, you know, you know something about Jewish history. I have these papers. Can you get them, do the right thing and get them out of here so we can finish our renovation. And it, it's Helen with the, the help of um, a grad student named Aaron Levy, American, Jewish, and a bit of a uh, a, a vain pain in the neck, at least at first, um, who, who begins to examine these documents that Esther Velasquez left behind. And um, I'm just going to read one more thing, uh, which is a few paragraphs when Helen first arrives at the house and sees the paper. And for anyone who's following along, this is on page 10. There on a small card table beside the window was a single cracked leather bound volume. 
Beside it lay the two pages Ian had told her about over the phone, the first items his electrician had removed from under the staircase upon discovering the documents. For an instant, she allowed herself to stare at the pages, taking in the thick textured paper she dared not touch, then at the counterpoint of two alphabets on the page, the Portuguese lettering that led from left to right, interrupted by scattered Hebrew phrases that ran in the reverse direction. Slowly, she read and reread. Ian's voice coming from just behind her. Over there, he said, and pointed. She lifted her eyes. There, in a dim corner at the base of the staircase, untouched by the blinding light of the landing's windows, was a small panel that had been forced open. Ignoring Ian's tentative offer of help, Helen approached the opening, lowering herself slowly to the floor, her cane trembling heavily under her weight. She knelt before it like a penitent. She stayed that way for a long time, her hands pressed to the cool floor, and a great heaviness nearly overcame her, as though all her years had suddenly taken on physical weight. For a long while, she simply stared at the crammed shelves, breathing very quietly. Then finally, knowing she should not, she lifted a quaking hand to remove a single page. A moment only. The page, astonishingly, rested unharmed on, our on her two outspread palms, like a bird that had agreed for just this moment to alight there. So I wrote that, and once I had written a little bit of Esther's voice and a little bit of Helen's voice, I suddenly had a sense of what I was after, that there was going to be some interplay between Helen and Esther, between the past and the present, that was going to be some kind of alchemy. Um, Helen's life had to be changed because of encountering Esther's papers. Um, and again, I started improvising, uh, no outline, and going back and forth. The book is structured, uh, you know, as most of you have read it, so you know, um, it's kind of like a mystery. Um, and um, going back and forth, we're with Helen and Aaron, and they find something. Who could have written this and why? I'm writing it. I'm thinking, who could have written that and why? And then I go back to the 17th century and I think, well, did Esther write this? Why did she write this? What was going on in her life? Um, and I loved working in that structure uh, for two reasons. One is that um, I always liked, um, well, A.S. Byatt's kindness, uh, not kindness, sorry, um, possession. A.S. Byatt's possession was one of the inspirations for writing this book. I love that dual structure. But also, it just feels very intuitive to me that um, you go back and forth with a history. Um, I grew up around a lot of history, which is kind of a, a dumb way to say it, because we all grew up around a lot of history. Anyone who's ever had a conversation with a parent or a grandparent grew up around a lot of history. But it was really striking to me, I suppose, because the history I was growing up around was so different from what um, from my own life. So because my grandparents were refugees and um, my mom and, and some of her um, cousins had been born along the way. So the dinner table conversation would be that's when we were in Russian prison past the salt. And you sort of you have two choices at that moment. You either keep your mouth shut and pass the salt or you start asking questions. But if you ask questions and you chase down the history, then eventually you pick it up and it's in your hands. Right. And when the history is in your hands, it's in your hands. What are you going to do with it? You're going to let yourself be changed by it? Are you going to let your actions in the world be changed by it? What are you going to do in response to it? So this idea that we're sort of going through our lives and history just pops up and then we have we have to make some choices was very um, meaningful to me. And that so that to me is what's behind that structure. We're with Helen and Aaron and then we're with Esther and back and forth. And I started writing and researching. Um, I'm sometimes asked how long did I research in advance of writing? Um, I didn't do it. Uh, in advance like that, because to me, that's a little like saying I'm going to swim a mile by standing on shore, doing all the breathing, and then I'll do all the swimming, right? It, you know, you pass out, it's interactive. So it would be, um, I'd be writing a scene, and the scene is a meal in 1664. But I got to stop a second because I realize I don't know what they're eating. And I don't know what the utensils are. And I don't know what the table manners are. So I go research those things. But also, what are they wearing? And is that clothing heavy? Those, you know, the farthingales and the whalebone stays and all of that. Is it heavy? And then when they look out the window, what's growing in the garden outside the window? But before that, they have to look through the glass. And the glass had to be those little panes. They couldn't make, the, you know, little mullion panes. They couldn't make the big sheets of glass. And it was kind of wavery because they didn't have the same glass making technology. So things would look different through that glass. And so I be I have books on 17th century. It's one of those whole bookcase back there is 17th century stuff. Um, 
sanitation and plumbing and philosophy and medicine and fashion. And I'd be looking something up in, you know, 17th century fashion. What are they wearing? And on the way to finding that, I would see a little um, etching of these women wearing those face masks that they wore to mask balls and out to the theater and anytime you were doing something a little untoward so you wore masks and no one would know it was you right so that you know it was sort of one of these a little bit of a game um so i thought who in the novel would wear a mask and this is not a spoiler for for those who haven't read the book the minute you meet catherine she's ill so catherine is ill and she wears a mask because she doesn't want people to see how ill she is and that's where i got the idea for the scene in hyde park where she's walking in a mask um so it was back and forth like that um i had fun starting from ignorance i went to rare manuscript rooms and i would i, I went to the old um jewish theological seminary uh rare books room it's been uh moved now it's not there now but um you could view 400 year old documents and you would find doodles in the margins. Some scribe made doodles of someone's face, faces in the margins. And you know, human faces look the same now as they did 400 years ago. Suddenly it's, it's just very humanizing. If you're ever in a library and you have a chance to go look at something really, really old, do it. They might make you wear gloves and they might confiscate your pencils and whatever else, but it's, it's just very cool. Um, I got to go to document conservation labs. I learned about iron gall ink, which burns through paper over the years. Some formulations have been burned through paper. And you have these beautiful pages that are like lattice work where the word Words have burned themselves out of the paper. Um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to handle 17th century language. That was, and again, if anyone wants to talk about that, just go ahead and ask in Q and A, and I will tell you more than you ever wanted to know about thinking about how you use it, do a 17th century language that people can actually read now, um, and what choices were involved. Um, but I'll just close by saying um, something about the reasons I was so careful about the research. I tried to be really careful. I still made some mistakes and thank goodness for multiple printings because uh, with every new printing, I've just gone running to basically running to the printer and saying, oh, can you change these two or three things? Because uh, readers write into me and have pointed out some, um, my favorite is someone said at the start of chapter six, where it says the sharp disc of the moon and a reader wrote in and said, you know, there was not a full moon on that date. And it was at 1648 or whatever it is in that scene. And which is uh, totally right. And I had the Hebrew date there. And of course, it's a lunar calendar. And I had, I was so busy matching up the Hebrew date to the English and making sure that there was enough time for the, the crossing of the channel to happen with Manasseh ben Israel. And I finally got the dates right. But then I didn't realize it's not a full moon. So things like that, um, readers write in and I, I've tried to adjust them. But so why am I so careful about the research? Because people say to me, well, you know, it's just fiction. So why be so careful? But it's two reasons. One is that um, you don't want to, um, it's like a soap bubble art, right? It's delicate and you don't want to pop the illusion. And if you've ever been watching a movie or a TV series or or something reading a book that is set somewhere where you've lived or in a profession you've worked in or something like that and they get even one detail wrong the whole thing is is blown right you know because you're sitting there and you know that from that hilltop you can't see the ocean even though the writer is telling you you can because you know there's a mountain in between but they didn't do their research so they don't know that or you know you're you're the um you're the doctor who's watching that um medical drama on tv and you know no nurse would ever do what that nurse does right um so it sort of blows the illusion and you're pulled out of the illusion of fiction um and if you're trying to write something immersive that's counterproductive so you want to be careful for that reason but the other reason uh was that i thought when i finish this novel if i ever finish this novel because it took me a really long time i thought people are going to say to me um yeah esther velasquez is a you know it, that's a pretty story but obviously nothing like that ever happened because we know the names of the six or seven women who wrote anything approaching philosophy in 17th century england and we know that pretty much all of them were um wealthy christian aristocratic and childless uh with two exceptions uh, afro ben was a um wealthy christian and childless but not an aristocrat and anne of conway was a wealthy christian aristocrat who had one child who was taken care of for her she had migraine she would stay in bed and write philosophy there everybody else was all for the things certainly they were not jewish they were not poor um and um so I thought people are going to say that to me and I wanted to be able to say, well, yes, obviously Esther Velasquez is fictitious I made her up. Um, but how do we know that someone didn't try to do this? 
didn't try to find a way to live a life of the mind. Because if you think about, we've got centuries of history in which all manner of people were um, barred from uh, access to education, to publishing, to all kinds of things because of their um, gender, race, skin color, um, ethnicity, all kinds of things. But for now, for the moment, let's just focus on gender. We have hundreds of years of this. And yet, you know, look, most people are defeated by this kind of crushing restrictions. I mean, domestic labor in itself was crushing. When you look at just what's involved to do laundry in 1666, it's like your life, your whole life. Um, but people still try to do what the grass does. They try to grow up through the pavement. And most don't succeed, but some do. We know now that uh, some of the music that we thought uh, we have published under the name of Felix Mendelssohn, it was published at his as his music, was actually written by his sister Fanny. Lauren Belfer wrote about that beautifully in her novel, And After the Fire. Um, just because something is against the rules doesn't mean it's not happening. Are we so sure just because it's 2021, we've already found everything that was done by a woman against the rules? I mean, they, women did things uh, un anonymously, you know, the saying anonymous was a woman. They did things under men's names. Um, and um, Hilary Mantel, the author of the Wolf Hall novels, said at one point, she described the historical record as, quote, what's left in the sieve after the centuries have run through it. That sieve, the historical record, is designed to catch certain lives. In, in 17th century London, it was designed to catch and record the lives of generals, of royalty. If you were anybody else, pretty much you had a birth date, a death date, maybe a marriage date, and otherwise your life ran through the sieve of that historical record. There is no retrieving most of the stories of those lives unless you imagine them through fiction. And that's one of the things I think good historical fiction can do really well. It can give us back some of those lives that ran through the sieve. Um, but of course, you have to imagine a lot. But I, I, it was very important to me to imagine it within the strictures of, of really paying attention to the historical fact. I wanted every piece to be plausible. If I said that a loaf of bread cost something in 1666, I wanted that to be right. Because I wanted to, to make the larger point that take this history seriously. And you can, you can see that their women could have maybe found their way through it in, in these ways. And who knows, maybe someone did. Um, so that is a whole lot from me. And I am delighted now to hear what questions people have or what people want to talk about. Great. Thank you. So far, so good. It looks like Zoom is holding up as well. So <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed. So thank you. The great introduction and background to the book. And for those people who read the book, it's um, a great understanding of the book. So here are a few things that I have, and then people, please, I see people raise questions, send your questions so we can get to as many as possible. I wanted to mention that what's cool about this book and your writing is that it really crosses over with many of the programs and the themes that we've covered over the last 21 years of CSP. So Professor Zipperstein was our um, adult retreat um, speaker many years ago, for those of you with us. Um, um, we've done programs of Menashev in Israel and his relationship, for example, with Rembrandt. We've obviously, we focused on Sabbatianism and, and the challenge that it created for the world. We've even just recently focused on Jewish Amsterdam through art and books. So, um, and of course, we have friends here in Orange County that are named the Velasquez family. So- <laughs> As everything in your book kind of comes together. So that was great. You mentioned it took you a while to write the book and you talked about your process. How long did it actually take from when you first thought of the idea to when it was actually published? Hmm. Uh, 12 years. But I had, um, I had young kids and I, um, uh, I wrote some essays and, and a novella and short stories in between. And I was teaching, but I just kept coming back to it. Um, yeah, I used to, um, when I did a little, some of my initial readings with the book, sometimes my son would show up. I started the book when I was pregnant with him. So if someone would ask, how long did the book take? And he would just stand up, you know, age 12 and be like, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it was very, uh, very long. Um, but um, but it, it was actually, it was so much fun. I think partly the improvisational quality made it fun. I can't imagine if I had known in advance everything that was going to happen and I was just kind of trudging through an outline. I can't imagine. That would have been kind of boring. Um, also, I wanted to say about the family, and it's interesting you have a Velasquez. Um, people, I, I've gone to several communities where people have said, yes, these are the same names. I actually, to, to find the last names that I use for the characters in my book, I read um, Miriam Bodian has a book about the Jewish community of uh, Amsterdam, and there are a few other books. And I just went and I found really, really common last names from that community. And I did some combinations of 
of those. Uh, Esther, the name Esther was also the most common name that Jewish families gave their daughters during the Inquisition because of the implications of um, it being Esther was a Jewish woman who had to hide her Judaism and ended up saving her people. So in a time when people were afraid to, to show their Judaism, it was a, it was a common name. So you talked about, that's amazing. I was going to ask you those questions about where you got the names from. So you've <laughs> answered them. You answered many questions in, in your program already. Um, in writing this over 12 years, did you, and, and the way you wrote, did you go off in directions that you had to throw away or did you, did you really write this book sequentially and did you stick to how it evolved? Um, you know, I think when I had an idea that was really radically something different, um, that became a short story or this novella I wrote. I, I wrote a novella, it's only available as an ebook and soon it'll be an audiobook. It's called I Was Here. And it's like a, a crime story, you know, witness intimidation contemporary. I mean, it's just totally different. And I think that was, um, so I, I would put radically different ideas into different things. But for this, I just kept, kept coming back to it. I actually wrote it, weirdly enough, I wrote it in the order it's in, um, which meant that I would write the contemporary chapters in, you know, three weeks per chapter. I mean, it just was so much easier because the language is native to me. And then I would spend months on each 17th century chapter, just getting all the details and, and all of that. But I just needed to write it in, in that order. Yeah. Um, people have asked about the name of the book. Now, it comes from something in the, one of the letters, I assume. And it's, just a, it's a great name. But is there anything you would like to add about the name of the book and why uh, you chose it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was not the name. Of, it was not the working title for 10 of those 12 years. Um, in fact, probably 11. Um, yeah, so when I made a slip before and I referred to A.S. Byatt's book, Kindness, A.S. Byatt's book is called Possession. The working title of this novel was Kindness for um, 10 or 11 years. And um, the reason for that, actually, and, uh, how do I not make this too much of a shaggy dog story? You know, you know how I said there were two things that were bugging me and prompted me to write the book, and then I talked about the Virginia Woolf, right? The other one is uh, had to do with the Masada story. Um, so I think I could probably, most people have a basic familiarity with the Masada story, right? In the sense that it was this mass suicide and, and, um, and what we know about it, well, um, we know that um, uh, Eliezer made this speech. He was the leader of the Jews on top of Masada. He made a speech um, uh, trying to persuade the men to do the, the mass suicide. And he said, let us now do for ourselves, our wives and our children, a kindness while it is still possible to do ourselves any kindness. Now, kindness referring to mass suicide. So it's a very double-edged word. And then, of course, um, you know, many people know the story. Not as many people know about uh, the two women who hid in a cave. They're a footnote in history. They um, refused the mass suicide. They hid in a cave with some children. And when the Romans came up and found everyone dead and, you know, they, these two women were found in a cave and they, they chose slavery rather than suicide. And, um, they told the story to Eliezer, uh, to, sorry, to Josephus, and he wrote it in the Jewish Wars. And that's how we know the story of Masada, because otherwise, if everyone died, how do we know what Eliezer said, right? Sort of a, a hole in the story that was never filled in when I was growing up. But when I was growing up, the one teacher who ever mentioned these two women who hid in a cave referred to them as cowards and traitors, which bothered me. Um, and I just thought there's a watermark of a different choice, of a choice not to be martyrs in, in Jewish history. And it's made by women in this, in this story. So I wanted to write about it. And that I called the book kindness because it was a double-edged word. Do we need, and those who've read the book, you know, by the end, Esther's final letter that she writes is wrestling with the notion of kindness. And she says, we need a new definition of kindness for women, one that does not involve martyrdom, one that does not involve giving up your commitment to yourself, um, what uh, Spinoza called kanatus. Um, so um, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to call the book Kindness. This is perfect, right? Because it's double-edged. And I even, you know, the, um, the epigraph, the opening quotes, in addition to the Shakespeare quote, I had had that quote from Eliezer, let us do for ourselves and our wives and our children a kindness. The book was all kindness, great. And uh, a series of people, including my agent, informed me that there was no way I could call the book Kindness. Among other things, they told me that uh, it would get misshelved in self-help alongside hope and optimism and all these other things. And you know what? They were absolutely right. And I was very cranky about this because 
I thought it was the perfect title because it was double-edged and all that. And someone gently pointed out to me that it was the perfect title for me because I knew that that term was double-edged, but nobody else was going to know that, right? Uh, just in a bookstore and the way books are marketed. So then we needed a new title. And, I, you know, it, and then it was just like a circus. Everybody's suggesting titles. Somebody wanted me to call it the House of Olive. Every time I said that, people thought I was saying Olive. Um, I, I, I had a couple titles that I was like, how about this one? Nobody liked them. And, you know, I mean, it's up to me to decide, but I, I you know, I want to, I had good advisors. I wanted to do a title that, that worked for people. And it got to the point where I remember emailing my agent and just saying, we're going to call this Bookie McBookface because I can't remember that Bodie McBookface thing in England. Anyway, I said, we're going to call the book Bookie McBookface because I can't think of anything else. And then my wonderful editor, um, Lauren Ween said, um, how about the cost of ink, the price of ink, ink, and then we started talking, and then we, we came up with a way to ink. And um, I, uh, I don't remember which one of us came up with the final title. It was probably her. And I thought it was perfect because it's, it's, it's the, the significance of ink, the, the danger of it, the risk of it. We still live in a world where people can be um, killed for expressing their thoughts on paper. You know, we live in the world where, you know, we know about Khashoggi. We know about so many other journalists and writers. And... Um, and it was not a small risk to put your thoughts on paper. And so I, I love that. And then there was a scene in the book where I already had the rabbi, to, see if I can just open up to it. I, I usually have it marked. Um, the rabbi is talking about um, his memory of, um, of when he lost his vision. And um, he already, I already had a scene in there where he was talking about losing his vision. And all I needed to do was drop the phrase weight of ink right in there was already there, but I'm not going to waste everybody's time looking for it. Maybe I'll find it later. So I think it's the perfect title, but it took me a really long time to, uh, to it, get it, to it. It's a great title. And that was Rosa Berman's question. I don't want to take credit for it. Um, okay. I do want to ask you about um, how hard or easy was it to get published? So was this, did you write this after you were published? So it was like you had, you had sold the, the book already, or did you write the book? then um, try to find a publisher for it? And if so, you know, you hear stories of people getting rejected and winning all these prizes. Was this that story or was yeah. it kind of you, you were accepted right away and it was success right away? Well, I was in a different situation than I would have been in my first time. So um, because I had published my second novel, Tolstoy Lied, a love story, very different kind of book with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, they had the option on my next book. So that means that whatever I write next, I am I, I both want to and I'm also obligated to show it to my publisher first before showing it to anyone else. That's that's what the option means. So um, my agent and I decided that um, we wanted that this is sort of an unusual book. And it at the time, you know, in retrospect, everything looks clearer. But at the time, it was it felt like a very risky book. Um, the history, the philosophy, it's a lot. And um, I was very worried when I was writing it about whether um, the reader was going to find it too dense or too daunting. And so if you'll notice, if you look at the way the book is structured, um, the odd number chapters are contemporary, the even are historical. And if you look, chapter the prologue and chapters two, four, and six are tiny. It's their letters. It's one page. It's two pages. It's never more than that. And I wanted the reader to have, and you're, most of the time you're with Helen and Aaron in the beginning. I wanted the reader to sort of slowly get familiar in the 17th century history and all of that. There's that one email Aaron sends to Marissa. Um, yes, it's an information dump, right? When he says, sit down, I'm going to lecture her. Because I had to, I had to convey some of what I had learned um, about the history in order for the story to make any sense. So I tried to do that as briefly as possible, but I was, I really just wanted to get it all right. And then I remember starting the chapter eight, which is the first full length 17th century chapter and thinking, oh God, <laughs> I really hope the reader's willing to jump in with two feet now. Cause then you're in, you're, that is a long chapter and you go down to the docks with Esther and, and, and the 17th century story is off and rolling. And I wanted to really get it right um, before submitting it. And my agent um, agreed and had a sort of a great plan for it. So we did the whole thing um, before showing it to them. So I wrote all these years without showing it really to anyone. I had a couple trusted readers, but I think I worked for six years before even showing sections to any readers. And I hadn't even registered it. And I was, I was about to um, go off, go away for a few days to try to um, finish that draft and get it ready to show to readers. And I was packing and I hadn't got, you know, I had young kids. I hadn't gone away at all in, in many, many years. And um, 
my son, who was then uh, uh, six years old, came into the room and found me in tears. And he said, um, Mom, what's going on? And I said, well, I've spent six years writing this. And I suddenly realized, what if it's not any good? And he was staunch. He was amazing. He said, Mom, even if every word of it is vomit, <laughs> it'll still be good with me. <laughs> so I was like, OK, that's, you know, but it's you sort of you're you're John Gardner said writing a novel is like sailing around the world alone. You really have to do a lot of it alone. And there was no point in me showing it to readers before that because it was a mess. So I had to do a lot of it alone. Then I showed it to some readers. Then my agent and I showed her finally a full draft. And we went back and forth. She She's a great editor, so she also gave me some notes. And we really got it polished up before we sent it to Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. So at that point, it was very simple. But it was, you know, a long time getting to that. But it was also my third novel. So, you know, when it's your first book, they don't know who you are. It takes, it really takes a while to get it out there. And even now, you know, it's, the publishing world is never, there's nothing for certain in the publishing world. You never know from book to book how it's going to go. Okay, great. Well, that's a very interesting background as to how it got published. Marlene asks, and I think I can guess the answers. She wants to know if you do your own research or do you have assistants that help you? Um, mostly my own research. Uh, I sometimes will hire an assistant for something, but I find that um, I really need to, even if an assistant brings me something, I've got to pour through it myself because it's like the tiny details that catch you. Um, you know, you're reading, uh, you're reading this huge thing about what happened in, in London during the plague, right? And then it's just this tiny detail that the Lord Mayor of London ordered all cats and dogs killed in London because um, it was believed that the cats and dogs were spreading the plague. And so 30,000 cats and dogs were killed. He, he offered money for every, every cat and dog that was killed. And then you, and don't I let read your dog, that. Don't let your dog hear yeah, this, yeah. by the way. He's, he's sleeping. Um, and I read that and um, I thought, wait a second, you know, and, and then the bird, there would be bird song. There would be all the natural predators, not to mention they killed off all the natural predators of the rats who actually were carrying the plague. And the plague didn't abate till the Great Fire of London burned the thatch roofs that the rats were nesting in. Um, but, you know, you know, I ran across that little detail and it turned into a scene where Esther's walking in the middle of the plague and she goes to Hyde Park, back to Hyde Park, and there's bird song and it's because all the cats are gone. Um, so you just, I, I find that I have to do it myself, most of it. Um, I think it's Neil, but ask the question. I'm going to kind of rephrase it. He said, what was the most surprising question you've been asked about the story? You can answer that and or you can answer, I assume the audience is going to be a Jewish audience, but I assume you also have non-Jewish audience. So can you talk about your different audiences and, and how they've kind of taken to the book or questions mm -hmm. they've had, how they differ? <laughs> Um, I can answer both the, the most surprising question. I was giving a talk and someone said, um, are Esther's philosophical questions yours? And I just kind of laughed it off at first. I said, I don't have any philosophical questions. I'd never taken philosophy. I'd never. And then I realized that that was after, unfortunately, I'd already left the event and I realized that I'd given a really dumb answer because in fact, even though the philosophical vocabulary was unfamiliar to me and was very intimidating to me, I used to find it very desiccated and very difficult. Um, I realized that it's a really useful vocabulary for asking questions I've been wrestling with my whole life. You know, growing up post-Holocaust with my family being what it was, and then I would, um, I went to a Solomon Schechter and I would, you know, be, in, you know, reading the Tefillah and, and you know, if, if you really believe that God saves and does all these things, then how do you reconcile, I mean, the classic question of faith after the Holocaust. And in fact, I was working it through with Esther through this philosophical vocabulary, trying to understand what kind of God she could believe in, in the middle of the Inquisition and after what's happened to her own family. Um, so actually, that was a really helpful question because I suddenly realized, no, actually, I do have philosophical questions and this was a way to, to sort of work them through. The different audiences, I've had um, a lot of non-Jewish readers. Uh, what's been interesting also is that the book has been taught in some philosophy classes. I got invited to a philosophy conference. Uh, which was terrifying, but the conference was in a medieval castle in Italy, so I had to say yes because how cool is that? Um, and um, they were very, they were very gentle with me. They were very nice. I just said like I don't, I don't speak this language, but it was about how do you make philosophy feel more relevant to people when philosophy is seen as like a, a you know, dead white man's club, um, the way it's often taught, and how do you bring in philosophers from the Muslim world and from different, you know, different parts of the world, and how do you make it more humanized? So. Um, so they were very tolerant and, and invited me, which was nice. But it, it's been interesting, a lot of different audiences. 
I personally don't enjoy reading history because I find it boring. I rather like to learn it through nonfiction. So that's what I enjoyed about your book. Because not only does it bring together 21 years of CSP and a lot of something other things I've read, <laughs> but it 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 also gave me a view into the history um, that you talked about, and that I I knew pieces of it. I didn't um, know as much, and um, and also makes me want to go research Spinoza a little more. And now we're going to do a CSP program on Spinoza because of you, is my guess. Oh. Nice. Um, people have asked a little bit more about your background. Is Kadish your name? Um, mm-hmm. They've also asked, you know, about like what you studied in school, and you did you really did you know you were going to be a writer, for example? Um, yes, uh, I I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know any writers when I was a kid, so that was sort of. You know, I, I, well, I knew teachers because I had teachers, so I thought maybe I'll be a teacher and a writer. And uh, I have a lot of science and medicine people in my family, so I was interested in that uh, too. But um, uh, Kadish is, is, yeah, the family's name. It probably was um, Kadishevitz before Ellis Island uh, officials lopped off part of it. Um, and that's uh, Lithuania and uh yeah, mostly from Lithuania, I think. Um, some Hungary, some, and and my mom's family is all from Poland. They're um, Stein Herzigs. Um, but I studied English and creative writing. Um, I had a um, unbelievably good fortune. Um, I didn't. Sorry, where did you to, study? I, did I was I was at Princeton, but I had the unbelievably good fortune to study with Toni Morrison, and she was my hmm. thesis advisor. What year were you there? By so the way, so I graduated in ninety one. I'm eighty nine. Class of eighty nine. So we were there together. Oh. Excellent. Okay. okay. We'll have to play the name game. Right. Um, but um, so, I, you know, she, I learned so much from her about writing historical fiction, um, even though my thesis was a, a part of a historical novel that is sitting in a box in my basement. But just the conversations with her about it were sort of um, really, really incredible and stay with me very much. Um, and so I, you know, I knew I wanted to do that. Um, uh, and uh, to go back also, you said something about uh, reading history and history being sometimes dry and boring. I think that I, I, cause I always felt the same way. That's what stopped me from being a history major. I considered it in college cause I loved history, but the way we study history ends up feeling I, what I, what's in my head is boring, but then I have to stop and say, actually, I think the problem isn't that it's boring. I think the way we study history is too safe, right? We study it from a distance and look, we, you know, we're doing the best we can, right? Often we, all we have is some dry facts. But when you study history that way, it's like you're looking at a diorama and here are these little teeny figures living, living their little lives. And we have this insane, you know, advantage over them, which is that we know what's in tomorrow's newspaper and they don't. And so it's really hard not to be condescending, not to, even if you don't mean to, to have this kind of arrogance because you know what's going to happen tomorrow. So how can they not see it? And, and to sort of feel that a little bit. And to me, what I love about good historical fiction or film or art is that it makes, it makes history as scary as it should be, as unpredictable. You're walking the streets. You realize that people who are walking around between World War I and World War II they don't, they're not thinking, oh, I'm in the interwar period. Why would they think that? They have no idea there's another war coming, right? They're thinking it's Tuesday and I have things to do. And, you know, I'm in an argument with my cousin or whatever they're thinking. And that's how we all live our lives. And that's how history happens. They're all just, you know, in, in the middle of the surf with no idea what the next wave is going to bring, just like we are. And to me, when I read good historical art, it brings that humanity in and it makes it sort of that vulnerable feeling, which is, I think, a true sense of what, you know, if you want to understand what people's lives were like. Um, so again, I love good historical fiction. I should t- teach a course in it now. Um, yeah, I think yeah. we have people who would sign up. You have 300 people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a creative writing class, so you have to write some. You can't just read okay, it. Okay, well, we'll cut down a little bit. <laughs> um, okay, we have time for just the last few questions. People have asked, and I think I asked you, and you wouldn't give it away, but they want to know what your next project is. So you don't have to tell us, but unless you want to. But the question that I think you can answer is, based on your success in writing The Weight of Ink and your other writing, um, A, do you feel a lot more pressure now when you write? And B, are you changing the way you write? Are you still writing the same way that you explained how you wrote The Weight of Ink? Mm. Um, You know, I'm still writing the same messy way. I had this idea that my life would be so much more um, organized and, you know, and this novel, because, you know, my kids are older now and everything. And then the pandemic hits. So, you know, <laughs> there's that. Um, and um, sense of pressure, um, not, I mean, maybe I should, 
but I feel like I never take anything for granted. No one, I feel like um, I'm very lucky to be able to be a writer. I get to, if I'm doing my job right, I get to sing my heart out for a living. That's a privilege. Um, I've gotten to do it through three novels and a novella so far. I am um, really having fun with the characters in this new novel. I hope it works out and um, I hope it does because I want to do right by these characters. Um, but I'm just, you know, the best I can do is the best I can do. I, I, um, I just, you know, my goal is always to write the best novel I can at the time with those materials. And I'm, I'm, you know, the new novel is contemporary, has a lot to do with um, some extremism in Eastern Europe and, and Central Europe and also some other post-Holocaust things, but uh, I won't be able to say much about it well, but I can say something, which is that I have a deadline, which is terrifying, but also good on October 1st for an essay that I'm writing for the Jewish Quarterly. And I'm really excited about that because it lets me... Um, talk about some some people I really want to talk about. Uh, it's nonfiction about my uh, my grandmother, my grandmother's high school boyfriend in Poland, anyone who who um, spent time around the Krakow Jewish Cultural Festival uh, might have met him. He was a tour guide there. So um, anyway, I'm having fun with that. So everyone should subscribe to the Jewish Quarterly. Yeah, how do we get it? So we'll have to get a copy of that in October second. Yeah, no, it's it's a yeah. Um, it's actually all um all you know joking about my own piece aside. They have just relaunched a magazine. It's wonderful. It's really really wonderful. This magazine dates back to the I think the 1950s in London, and it's been through a few different iterations. And um, I've just gotten the the um, latest. Each issue has a theme, and um, the last one was just uh, wonderful. Um, Deborah Lipstadt and um, Simon Shama, a bunch of other really just uh, terrific thought-provoking writers this latest issue just arrived but i'm not allowed to read it till i meet my own deadline but um it's uh about the middle east and my, my piece won't won't come out my, my deadline is this fall but it won't come out till the spring so um but i think it's a really um wonderful and worthwhile journal to subscribe to i'm putting um, uh, jennifer malvin gave me the link so i'm putting it in for everybody to check out um i guess last question aside from being a mom um, a caretaker for a dog who's very cute and he's awake. But it's a oh, he, he's right? awake now. <laughs> yeah. People have asked what kind of dog it is. Just, just might as well give it's him an Australian answer. Labradoodle. Uh, Australian Lab, lab Poodle cute. Cocker Spaniel. Yeah. Um, he's so, Henry David Thoreau. Yeah. <laughs> got it. So you're a writer, you're a mom. Um, I assume, is there anything else that you work on um, besides writing? I mean, I think you've mentioned some of the projects. Maybe I that teach. You do. Um, I right? teach. So what do you teach? And I teach creative writing um, to mostly adult students, often grad students, but um, but it's, um, I teach at Lesley University and at Harvard Extension School, which is open enrollment. Um, and um, I also um, co-founded this project and, and we've been um, knocked back in what we can do during the pandemic, but with um, uh, Derek Miller and Julie Lindahl um, called Voices Between, Stories Against Extremism. And uh, um, Julie Lindahl's uh, memoir called the, is called The Pendulum. Um, she um, is a really beautiful writer who has done something very brave, which is she grew up um, in, um, in Brazil from, in a uh, German family. Um, and she was the one who started asking the questions about when their family had come there and why they had come there. And she unearthed, I mean, her grandfather was quite high up in the SS. And uh, she wrote a very powerful memoir about this. And she and Derek and I um, have come together and done some events. Uh, we did some events in, in Sweden before the pandemic, um, just talking about uh, tolerance through the arts. So I'm hoping we can do more with that going forward. Great. Well, what a terrific program. I wanted to thank um, uh, Judy Gelman, I guess, uh, for again, for uh, making the introduction. And uh, I told her what I was looking for, and she recommended you. So you're the first of her recommendations. Uh, I will email her and thank her personally. But thank you for the thank energy you. you brought to us today. And a great book, a great book. You look, uh, you know, usually I would say um, synagogue is very long. So if you're going to services, bring a good book with you. This year, most people aren't going in the synagogue. But if you are, it is a great book to read anytime. But <laughs> I like to read books like this, this time of year in particular. So I um, highly recommend you get your copy. It is very I don't know whether it's the paper that's printed on, but this is a very thick book. I think it's the paper, mm -hmm. right? Is it the paper that's printed on? Because it's, I mean, it's a very long book. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine is about 544 pages, but it's yeah. a very thick paper. So, um, yes. but it is, um, it pulls you in, it pulls you into a world that um, you may not know about. And even if you know about it, it'll take you directions you haven't thought about. And uh, thank you for 
giving us the background of how you wrote it and your uh, 12 years <laughs> experience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm glad you wrote it. We are all uh, learning from it. We hope to have you back, talk about some of your other books and projects if you're amenable and available. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'd love that. What a, what a great group. And Shana Tava to everyone. Shana Tava to everyone as well. Look forward to seeing you more with CSP, occsp.net. Take care, be safe, and um, see you guys soon. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Good to see you all. And I'm happy that Zoom worked today. Mary Craft is happy too. <laughs> yes, me too. Hey, Take care. Happy. Okay, bye.